What are your goals and values for the future? It's a new year. It's January. Maybe we're all supposed to be doing this. I'm not sure, but let's find out in this video. Before I dive in, go grab a pen and paper and write down your goals and your values. Don't put too much thought into this because my goal or hope for this video is to give you a framework to understand values and goals. So I'm going to be very interested if by the end of this video, those values and goals have changed or stayed the same. If they change, that's awesome. You've learned something, but if they don't change, that's awesome too. You will have also learned something. It's a win-win situation. So this is my dog, Gogo, and I'm fully aware that I'm trying to win you over by showing you cute pictures of my dog. I totally own that. And there is a point to it with regards to this video. I've had him for about three years. He's my first dog. And one of the things that I had read or heard somewhere when I was thinking about getting him was that dog training is not only good for the dog in terms of their anxiety, but it also helps you bond. And it's also something that you need to be doing constantly. So I had a goal of being the world's best dog dad slash therapist slash dog trainer. And I really wanted to be present with him on these walks and have these magical man and his dog moments in the wild, wild west of Beverly Hills. And guess what? I have totally failed at that goal because the other day we were walking down Melrose Avenue in the morning and I suddenly looked down at my dog, my very white dog, and he was bright red. Because what I hadn't noticed while checking my emails on my phone, texting a friend and simultaneously listening to an audio book was that they were painting the red do not park here part of the curb all along the road. And not only had I stepped in red paint, leaving red footprints all the way down Melrose Avenue, but Gogo had basically rolled in it and was now a red and white dog. So my goal of being present and attuned and at one as man and dog went horribly wrong somewhere over the past few years. This got me thinking about the kinds of goals we set for ourselves, the ones that work and the ones that don't. Let me tell you a little bit about what this looks like in my private practice. I'm a licensed and marriage family therapist, and I've been working with couples, families, and adults for about 10 years. And I've got a bit of a reputation of being a family therapist. So I work with a lot of parents. I'll tell you about a made up client, a dad, we'll call him Peter. And Peter had a fictitious teenage daughter who was really struggling with some oppositional and impulsive behaviors. Peter told me that his daughter's grades had dropped drastically at school. She'd stolen money bought things online without his permission, using his credit cards. It was a pretty bad situation. Obviously, Peter didn't set out holding his newborn daughter with the goal of raising her to steal money, get bad grades, and uh, run, threaten to run away. And in fact, his goals were like any parent. They were the exact opposite of that. Just like me wanting to be the ultimate dog dad to be present on walks, he had lost sight of the goal. and was questioning why and how to get back on track with his daughter and his parenting. Now for me to get back on track with the goal of being present on dog walks, I could just not take the phone with me. It would be that simple. But it's not quite as simple as putting the phone down for my client or Peter. And part of the issue with Peter was that, was that his goals were constantly being compromised by the opinions of other people. So for instance, he told me that a psychiatrist had told him that his child had an issue with impulsivity and when she's in that frame of mind and she wants to do something, she'll just go and do it. So it's really not her fault that she does these things. Her therapist told him that underneath all of these behaviors, the rule breaking, the stealing, the breaking of curfews, she has a lot of shame about her behavior. So Peter shouldn't come down too hard because she'll beat herself up even more. Peter had started to doubt his instincts, his own resolutions as a parent, and his desire to be a good, strong, firm parent were being worn down by the opinions of other people. It's as if his sense of self and the goals he set for himself as a parent were being blown off course by people with authority and power. 
it's a bit like peer pressure, right? Like caving in to go to that restaurant that you really can't stand, but you end up going because everybody else wants to go. We all occasionally have to shift what we believe in and who we are to accommodate other people. But doing this constantly makes it really hard to follow through with our goals. So what do we do about this? Well, we have to get a bit more clear on who we are as individuals. And this is how I explain it to people in my private practice. This is the work of Dr. Murray Bowen, who is one of the founding fathers of family systems theory. And he talks about differentiation of self. This is a differentiated person. And there is no one on the planet that looks like this. A differentiated person, though, can really easily separate out their thought, feelings, self, and other. And because they can separate out their thoughts, feelings, self, and other, they have this lovely, solid boundary around themselves. This person is going to listen to the psychiatrist, the therapist, and the teachers, and then decide how to use that information in such a way that it aligns with their own goals and personal beliefs. Now, the bad news for everyone here is that we are nothing like this. And in fact, we all look a bit more like that. This is an undifferentiated person. We have a lot of difficulty separating out our thoughts, feelings, self, and other. So what does that look like? I hear you ask. Well, I will ask a client, a new client in my office, I should add, something like, how did it feel when your partner came home late again? Well, I feel that that is what they always do. Yes, but how did it feel when your partner came home late. I don't know. The writing was on the wall. Nine times out of 10, when you ask someone how they feel, they will reply with a thought. In fact, whenever you hear somebody say, I feel that, I can guarantee you that the words after that will be a thought and not a feeling. The self and other aspects are a little harder to describe, but we all have an internalized version of ourself inside us. And that's our sense of self, our identity, our personal history. But we also carry around an internalized version of the other. That's other people. So for example, when you're out shopping and deciding what to buy your friend for their birthday, you might conjure up an internalized version of your friend, other, and you might imagine what they would like or imagine their response when you give them the gift. There's a problem though, because self and other get mushed up. And that's an issue because you can't separate out your thoughts and feelings from the other person's thoughts and feelings. When families come and see me, I can almost guarantee right from the start that someone in that family is going to speak from the we position rather than the I position when I ask something like, so how does it feel to be in therapy? We are just so glad that we came here and we made this decision. And how do you feel to be in therapy? We are just thrilled that you managed to fit us in your schedule. Now, I'm fairly certain not everyone in the family actually feels the same way, particularly if there are teenagers involved. I want people in the families that I work with to be speaking for themselves because I want people to separate out their self from others. The more we do this, the more differentiated we become. So one of the main differences between a differentiated person and an undifferentiated person are these boundaries. In an undifferentiated person, they are porous or sort of dotted. And what that means is that they are much easily swayed by the opinions, thoughts, and feelings of other people around them. Differentiated people, however, with those nice, solid boundaries, they hold on to their sense of self. They will consider other people's opinions and then make their own decisions. The problem today is if that we haven't done the work to become as differentiated as humanly possible is that our boundaries remain very open and porous to the ideas, suggestions, thoughts, and opinions of other people. That is why Peter was being influenced by the teachers, the therapists, the psychiatrist. He lost his sense of self and he didn't have guiding values and goals to help him identify which was his and which were other. In order for us to know what our goals are, we have to know ourselves. We have to be able to separate out our thoughts and feelings and self and other. That is because there are two types of goals that we can set. We can set goals that are intrinsic and those that are extrinsic. Extrinsic goals are about something outside of us, other, that we think will make us feel better or we think we need. They're more about things outside of ourselves. Um, they feel good in the short run, but really in the long run, they don't do a lot for us. So this has completely ruined my goals of buying a yacht and a small tropical island that I have had because extrinsic goals 
aren't the best ones to go for. Now, obviously you do need some extrinsic goals. So this year I need to pay for credit card. That's an extrinsic goal. Nothing wrong with that. There's plenty of research showing that if we only focus on those extrinsic goals, it's actually detrimental to our uh, well-being. We don't feel as good. And this is actually based on a study of 70,000 people. So it's pretty solid evidence base here. If we are going to be setting goals in this video, we need to make sure that we're going to be setting goals that are more aligned with our intrinsic goals, our sense of self. And of course, the other part of this study found that when goals are closely correlated with one's personal values, we feel much better and are more likely to attain them. Intrinsic goals become extensions of our self, our beliefs and our aspirations. And that alignment incorporates our feelings because these goals are deeply meaningful and resonant on a very personal level, making the pursuit of these goals much more engaging and um, motivating. But when your goals are seen as reflections of your values, they are sort of imbued with the sense of purpose and significance. So they're not just things you have to do or more things on your to-do list buy a yacht, buy an island. When we separate out self from others and thoughts from feelings, we find out slowly what motivates us internally. So we're all set, right? I can end the video, you can hit stop, and we just need to figure out our values that are in line with ourselves. No, because who ever taught you how to find your authentic self or the values or purpose within you? No one. Instead, we learned algebra. I think this is a travesty because our values are to our direction in life as the North Pole is to a compass. Think about it. Our values provide us with a clear direction of where we want to go. And you can get very, very lost without knowing them. So if creativity is a value for me, I might not be very happy if I become an accountant. If, if truth and honesty are a core value for me, probably don't want to go work for TNC. Let's get really clear on what a value is though. A value is just something that you place importance on. Anything that you hold dear to yourself can be a value. Now you could of course think about your values, but as we just saw, we want to be able to make sure that it's not all thoughts. We need to have the feelings too. So there's one exercise that we can do now. And it goes like this. If you take a minute and close your eyes, if you feel comfortable closing your eyes and Recall the first memory that you have as a child in which you were happy. So allow whatever that is to pop up from your unconscious, even if it's weird or you weren't expecting it. You got it? Don't edit and find another one. Go with the first one, even if you think it's weird and random and doesn't make any sense and it's kind of boring. Stick with it. When I did this, I had a really bizarre memory that I hadn't thought about for decades of me cutting up pink furry pencil case to make a collage. And I think my mum was there helping me turn the fur from that pencil case into blossoms on a cherry tree that grew outside our house. And it was a school project that she was helping me with. I don't know. So out of all of the thousands of millions of memories that you could have pulled out from the darkest corners of your brain, that is the one that came up for me. And the one that you're thinking about is the one that came up for you. That moment meant something to you back then, enough for it to be stored for future recall. And because I asked you to remember a fun memory, that means that there's something of value associated with that memory. So perhaps you can immediately identify that value. And if so, write it down underneath the list of values that you did at the start of the video. If not, write down what you think it might be, and we will run it through my values page. This is a way that I've come up with to identify values. And the first layer of it is means to an end part of the matrix. And there's a really obvious example here just to explain what means and ends are. If someone tells me that they value money, which is incidentally on my values list, I will ask immediately, is that a feeling or an emotional state of mind? If not, the next question is something like, if you had lots of it, more of it, could do it more often, depends what the word is, right? Would you, in theory, be in a different emotional state of mind or feel differently? If the answer to that is no, probably not a feeling, but let's keep thinking about what feelings 
are associated with that item? If the answer is yes, that's great. If you had all of the money you wanted, what would you feel? Some people might say powerful. Some people might say safe or secure. Those are values. Those are feelings or, in, or emotional states of mind. Money is the means to get to the end, and the end is a value. Values tend to be feelings or emotional states of mind, powerful, safe, secure. Money is just the thing that in your mind you need to get there. But in reality, money is just one way to get to feeling powerful, safe, or secure. And if you only value money and are focused on that, you might miss other ways to get to feeling powerful, safe, or secure, which are more important to you anyway. So is cutting up pink furry pencil cases a value? If I had more time cutting up pencil cases, would, what would I feel? I don't know. So what feelings or states of mind are associated with this memory? It's creativity. And is that a feeling or a state of mind? Absolutely. So one of my core values is creativity, which is why I have so many neon visuals and if you were to speak to any of my clients, they might tell you that I have them talk to an empty chair. That's a psychodrama technique. Or they might tell you that I pulled out my infinite supply of colored post-it notes. I think I have every color. And I'm always drawing thoughts, feelings, self, and other on bits of paper. So you might be able to get a little deeper into your values through that exercise. But there's another layer of this matrix that we can put words through because we get to choose our values. That's kind of what we're doing in this video, right? We also tend to inherit values from our family and automatically assume that they are ours. I think about this a lot with religion. If your parents went to church every Sunday and they loved it and they value the church or they value their religion, that is fantastic. But just because they did does not mean that you have to too. You can choose if you value religion. And if you do, that's great. And if you don't, that's also great. I want you to have the choice of your own values. Take that list of values you wrote down at the start of this video. And if you've not done it already, run them through the matrix. Feel free to cross things off. Feel free to add new ones, whatever you want. And then from this list of values, which may or may not have changed, can you see if any of the goals you wrote down align directly with those values? If you can, that's fantastic. Make sure they are specific and detailed, not vague and broad. There is research showing that when you get specific and detailed, for example, I'm going to go for a run every Tuesday and Thursday as soon as I get home from work. That's very different from vague and broad goals of I will exercise more. Being specific is very helpful here. If you've got a goal that is aligned with your values, and you're being specific and detailed in that goal, that's fantastic. If you've not got goals from these values that you've run through the matrix, you can think about what goals you want to create from those values. And finally, you can take a look at the goals and see if you can change them subtly or drastically to fit closer to what you value and then make those goals specific and detailed too. So let's work backwards. You've got a list of goals that are specific and detailed there's evidence showing that that makes them much more achievable. Those goals that you've got are aligned with your values and you've determined if those values are yours or inherited and you've chosen them rather than just assumed that they are yours. You've also made sure that they're not a means value, that they are an end value. And how you got there was by separating out your thoughts, feelings, self and other. That means that you're making decisions from a much more differentiated place, it means that they are going to be much more solid in you. And they're sort of really about who you are as a self, your identity. They're in line with a guiding set of principles, which is all about what being more differentiated is about. All right. I hope that worked for you. Let me know if you reach those goals. Um, hit subscribe and follow if you found this interesting. I'd love to hear if this worked for you. I'd love to know what you liked, what you didn't like and I will make more videos for you.